Well, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm laughing going along because Dr. Cook was one of the happiest people that I ever met. He was also one of the brightest, one of the best basketball players that I ever met, uh, one of the greatest missionaries. And I'm not putting you on just because, you know, he's dead. He really was. He was also one of the biggest and one of the broadest. And uh, he had a great, he has a great wife, Annabelle, my wife, Pat, and I. We've loved them for years. We were missionaries together for ages. He was in the Philippines. I was in Latin America. And then he, uh, he, uh, I became president of this mission for a little while. And then we turned it over to Clyde, Dr., uh, Dr. Cook. And he took it over and made it a fabulous mission. Then he came over here. And this university, uh, it used to be Biola College when he came and made it into a university. You are blessed to have had a man of God. Don't you feel? I mean, he was a great, great man of God. Oh. Uh, they, uh, they took away the photo that you had up there. I thought it was going to stay for the whole thing, but he was always smiling. I, I'm sure he had to deal with some of you guys. He probably wasn't smiling then, but uh, nevertheless, all of, and he always wanted, I'm sure when he heard I was coming, he said, I'm cutting out, and he decided to go to heaven because he knew I was coming along, but uh, uh, he's rejoicing in heaven, you know. Uh, it reminded me of a verse that says, Though the outer nature is wasting away, the inner nature is renewed day after day. And you know, when you've lived a long life like I have and Cook and so many others, Hofer here, Hafer, uh, you, uh, we, uh, uh, you begin to realize that's true. The outer nature begins to give way. But you know, if you walk in the power of the Holy Spirit, like Clyde Cook and Annabelle did for generations, at least for 60 years, uh, you are renewed inside. And although the outer nature uh, can't play basketball like in the old days and can't jump over hoops like in the old days or do what some of you girls, I saw you exercising out there, you know, all this stuff. You can't do it anymore, most of us anyway. But inwardly, you're all renewed and super renewed and super duper renewed. Because if you walk in the power of the Holy Spirit day after day, month after month, year after year, when you hit 72 like Clyde was, I mean you are really super duper renewed. And Clyde was also a happy chap. He was also telling stories. You were talking something serious and he would throw you a curve and you felt he's ungodly this guy, you know. I mean we're talking about something serious and boom he throws you a funny story. And I wanted to know before I get going, I don't have too many minutes so don't worry, uh, how many have Hispanic backgrounds, either dad and mom or, yeah, we're not many, but we're loud, uh, we Hispanics, huh? Yeah, how many of you are just plain old Anglo gringos? Yeah, 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 you're calm, you're calm, I know. Well, you know, I know if I had asked Clyde, I was going to talk to him, uh, you know, and then I arrive on Saturday and they told me he's going to be with the Lord. I was going to ask him for permission to tell you this story, and I know he would approve. Uh, he, uh, uh, you know, there was these two guys who lived in La Mirada, but traveled to Hollywood because they worked in Hollywood, and they were Christians. And it's not a racist joke, so don't walk out, okay? One was black and one was white. And uh, so on the way to work, they would come and go from La Mirada to work in Hollywood. One day they got to discussing at the water fountain, is God black or white? Which is a reasonable point, isn't it, theologically? And so they got at it and they got to arguing. On the way home that night, back to La Mirada from Hollywood, they were at it. I bet you he's black, I bet you he's white. The white guy said, every picture I've ever seen is white. And the black guy said, well, he was born in the Middle East, he's got to be black. On the next day, they're off to Hollywood again and they were at it again. And they were really hot under the collar. And the one guy started shouting again and suddenly the white guy was driving lost control of the car, and he was killed. And as they were floating up to heaven, this is not in the Bible, uh, they, were, they were still arguing, I bet you he's black, I bet you he's white. So they get to the pearly gates, and here comes St. Peter. It, it's a Catholic story. And uh, say, yeah, St. Saint Peter, Saint Peter comes to the door, and he says, gentlemen, welcome to heaven. What can I do with you, for you? And they said, uh, St. Peter, first of all, we want to know, is God black or white? St. Peter said, gentlemen, sit in the heavenly lobby. In a few minutes, you'll find out for yourselves. So they sit on the edge of their chair, waiting for the Lord to show up. 
they hear the footsteps of the Lord, they jump to their feet, the Lord opens, the Lord walks in and he says, Buenos dias, señores. <laughs> yeah. So, the Hispanics liked it anyway. Huh? You guys, you Anglos better learn Spanish quick, both to survive in California and when you get to heaven, okay? <laughs> you know, I, uh, when I realized that Clyde had gone to be with the Lord, he's probably having a basketball game up there already, uh, having a great time in the presence of the Lord. The one we have to pray for is Annabelle and the family and those who really loved him deeply. But you know, he was a cheerful man. He was a great visionary man. He was a, a man of prayer in the midst of all his happiness and joking. He really believed in the power of God. He was a missionary in the Philippines, as I told you. And I want to read four verses from the scripture just to share in these minutes before Dr. Corey, who he and I have been friends for years too because he was at Gordon Conwell and I was on the board there. But I want to read four verses and three points that Clyde uh, Cook lived by that I have been infected by also and that uh, made us pull together for years, think alike, rejoice together, stay in touch and be a blessing uh, wherever we went. And these are lessons I learned years ago on the mission field. In John chapter 14, just four verses, let me read it to you and then tell you, uh, I wanted to tell you about not only Clyde's uh, dreaming and praying and obedience, but also three graduates from Biola that have blessed my life in a tremendous way. And you know, not knowing how many of you would be here today, having no idea that the Lord would take Clyde home on Friday night, I, I wanted to encourage you as first year, second, third, four year students to think of what an impact you can leave when your career comes to an end. And you know, at your age, naturally, you shouldn't spend too much time thinking about it, but once in a while you have to. Somebody goes off to be with the Lord. Dr. Cook, it could be your dad, your mom, your grandparents, somebody you love, your pastor, a brother, a sister. From time to time, we think about it. And I always had this notion when I was your age, a teenager and, and, and early 20s, I always thought, how will I finish the race? And when I look back, Will I be able to say, will the Lord say about me, Luis, well done, you good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over little, I'll put you over much. It's good to think of the end of the road so that the years between now and then, whenever that may be, may be fruitful and joyful. And that when you come to the end of the road, you'll have a minimum of regrets, not only because of the sinfulness side of things, but I'm thinking more of the fruitfulness side and the blessing that you can be to other people. So let me read the word of the Lord that I know Clyde would have been blessed by. It says in John... John chapter 14 and, and, and verse 12. Jesus is speaking. This is the NIV. I tell you the truth. Anyone who has faith in me will do what I have been doing. He will do even greater things than these because I am going to the Father. And I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Son may bring glory to the Father. You may ask me for anything in my name, and I will do it. If you love me, you will obey what I command. Now, there are three things that struck me when I was in the mission field in Mexico. The first thing is the Lord said to me, because I was going through a tremendous battle over having canceled, the government canceled the campaign. And I got a fever and I was lying in bed for about three weeks. And I read the Gospel of John over and over in every translation in Spanish and English. And I began to think, the Lord spoke to me and he said, first of all, Luis, I, I felt he canceled it so that I wouldn't get a big head. It was a big plan for us. We're going to have this massive Mexico City campaign and bam, the government cut it out and we lost all the money we invested and it was a very, very uh, shaking experience for me. But the Lord said, I know why I did this, but I want you to still dream great dreams and plan great plans because I have plans for you. And you know, Clyde Cook was the same way. When he's a missionary in the Philippines, his dream was that all of the Philippines would hear the good news in one generation. 
not two, three, or four, in one generation. And he was the leader of the field there uh, for OC International. And you know, he drummed up the troops, all the missionaries, and they got some of the best OC missionaries that my wife and I have ever known. And he organized them in such a way that they actually dreamt, how could we have a Bible preaching church within walking distance of every Filipino? Now you talk about dreaming big dreams. Oh man, imagine, and Cook, when he had a dream, he dumped it on you, and you had to do it or you get kicked out of the way, you know, and if he kicked you, you flew, because he was a big man, and he had strong legs and arms, and he was frightful, but, uh, you know, these guys picked up on it, and another guy called Jim Montgomery, who also studied at Biola in those years, uh, Jim Montgomery uh, did the plan in writing. And you know, they were able to see, before they left the field, 5,000 local churches planted within less than a decade because of that dream that they dreamed in the presence of God. It wasn't just any crazy dream. When the Lord says over here, he says, I like the King James once in a while, you know. I like it when it says, you probably don't know what the King James is. Don't worry, it's an old Bible. But uh, it says, verily, verily, I say unto thee, I like, verily, verily. This one says, I tell you the truth. You know, I mean, I prefer verily, verily. It, it kind of rams it home, you know. Verily, verily, I say unto you. And the Lord probably thought, they're not going to believe what I'm about to tell them, so I'll, I'll verily it twice. And uh, he says, whoever continues to believe in me, the works that I do, now this is Jesus talking, you also will do. And you'll do even greater works than these because I'm going to the Father. And you know, for you as students at this university, you love Jesus Christ, you know him, you came here because you want to be in an intellectually sound and a spiritually deep university like this one. What a blessing that the Lord allowed you to come here. But now you yeah, yeah, I feel the same way. I applaud it in my heart, you know. You know, you can go now and dream about your future. But dream dreams that are based on the word of God. Whether you become a psychologist or a business person or a, or a nurse or a teacher, whatever. But let your dreams be biblical dreams. Be the most successful businessman. Be the most wonderful nurse. Be the best psychologist that the world has ever seen. But remember the biblical dream that the gospel of Jesus Christ be proclaimed in all its glory. Whatever the work you do, whatever direction you take, wherever the Lord opens a door and puts you there. But remember, the great vision is to do the works of God. I was enjoying the music and the worship, the emphasis on the cross. And you know, that's the basis of our assurance of eternal life. But you know, there are still millions of people who don't know it. The fellow who, who started that mission called OC that Ron mentioned a few minutes ago, his name was Dick Hillis. He was one of the early guys at Biola when it was Bible Institute of Los Angeles. Perhaps you knew that's what Biola means. Anyway, it was downtown Los Angeles, uh, besides a church called the Church of the Open Door, which is, I don't think is there anymore. But there were two buildings, and the two buildings were close. And there was the church, and there was sort of a break between the buildings, and then there was some bu another building that was Biola, the Institute. And there were dorms and classrooms and so on. There were, this fellow, Dick Hillis, was there with his twin brother, Don. He's in heaven now, so I can tell all this story, and you can check it out. But... Uh, he, uh, he was a, a regular guy. Many of the people who become leaders are often thrown out of school. You, did you know that? They often, or they're on the verge of being thrown out. I'm sure Ron Hafer was thrown out many times, wherever it was that he studied. But uh, uh, the, Dick Hillis, one day with his brother, put a rope between the two buildings, and the girls were in the dorms on the other building, all the, 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 the girl students, the young women students. And he put a rope, and he built what appeared to be a, a, a guy, uh, and hung him like he had taken his life, hanging between the two buildings. So they put it at night, and in the morning, when all the students woke up and they looked out the window, the screaming, all of, oh, you know, one of the guys has taken his life, and apparently it was so real that they were sure that it was a real guy. You know, well, he got thrown out of Biola, and then he became the leader of one of the greatest missions that ever was, you know. <laughs> I'm not suggesting you do the same thing, you know. Clyde would approve, but I'm not so sure about Dr. Corey. 
because I don't know him that well. But Dr. Hillis was a guy who dreamt great dreams. Finally, you know what he did? He took off for China, and he worked with the China Inland Mission. And he was an inspiration to all of us. He got Cook, Clyde Cook, and he was a basketball player. And he started a thing called Venture for Victory, and Clyde was one of the early basketball players. Uh, long before the, uh, the, the Campus Crusade uh, uh, sports uh, teams and so on was this team. And Clyde was one of the early guys who used to play, and they went to the Philippines, and they went to Taiwan, and to other places in Asia, and even in Latin America, and they would testify for Jesus. But the great vision came in Clyde's life as it did in many of our lives, when he saw the multitudes that they were lost like lost sheep, and he said, we've got to do something about it. And he was always a creative fellow. He had a business mind. I'm not surprised that the business uh, department here is the largest, I hear, of the postgraduates, and that Clyde came up with it. You know, when he used to write his prayer letters, instead of usually you say, dear prayer partners or dear friends, he would always say, dear intercessors and investors, Dear intercess, I mean, he always thought. He wasn't just a glib guy. He looked crazy, but he was very intelligent, you know. And he, his, I always was impressed by that. Dear intercessors and investors. And that's how he looked at those people who supported him. People who invested in the ministry of the Philippines and wherever he went. And then, of course, when he became president of the whole mission over there. And then, of course, the university over here. But the Lord says to you, as a young person who's dreaming about the future, and you wonder what really God has. And you really never know 100%. Because the Lord opens doors and closes doors as he sees fit. But the great thing is this, the Lord is saying to you this morning, as you think about a, a solid man of God like Clyde Cook, he's saying to you, dream great dreams. Dream great dreams and plan great plans. Because he says, I'm going to the Father. And you know, this university, I'm sure, challenges you to think great dreams based on the Word of God. Not just crazy dreams of your own invention, but the thoughts of God. But you notice the second thing, as I read it perhaps, the Lord Jesus moves on from saying, you will do greater works than I do because I'm going to the Father. And then he suddenly moves into prayer. He says, I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Son may bring glory to the Father. You may ask me for anything in my name and I will do it. And I feel the Lord said, no, I know the Lord said to me, and we used to do it when Clyde and I were working together. And he says it to you today here at Biola University. He says, not only dream great dreams, pray great prayers. You know, the Lord is challenging us here to pray all out, step on the gas and make big prayers. He says, whatever you ask in my name, the Son will do it so that he may bring glory to the Father. You know, I don't know if you're like me, but when I was a kid, I used to always worry about my prayers. I used to feel, what if I'm praying out of the will of God? And when I had a bit of a big dream, I would think, what if this is an ego trip? This isn't really praying in the Spirit. But you know, when I watched Clyde dreaming of all the Philippines, the whole country, a local church within walking distance of every Filipino, walking distance, because many of them didn't have cars, especially in those years. Uh, and, and basically, it was achieved. There are thousands of churches within walking distance of just about most Filipinos. That was a big prayer. And sometimes if you have a big vision, you may be tempted to say, you know, uh, is this an ego trip? Is this a big-headed thing? Is this be of the Lord? Listen, if you're walking with God in the light, as far as you know, if you're working in the, in the Word of God, if as, as far as you know, there's no unconfessed, rebellious sin in your life, go ahead and pour out your heart before the Lord. Whatever your vision is, it may be outrageous. And you know, there are some dreams and visions that you should never tell other people. There was a president at Wheaton College called uh, Dr. Edmund. And Dr. Edmund was a missionary in Ecuador before he became president of Wheaton College. And in one of his devotionals, I remember reading where he said, you don't have to tell anybody else the vision and the dream that God puts in your heart. Sometimes your best friends or your closest family can turn out to be your biggest enemies in terms of visions and dreams. He said, only tell it when the Holy Spirit gives you permission to tell the vision and the dream that the Lord has 
put in your heart. And I want to recommend that. Yes, sometimes it's good to tell your prayer partners. Sometimes it's good to hold back until the Holy Spirit says, okay, tell them now. And then you can tell them and they're going to be with you. But you know, he says, pray great prayers. And you know, just pour out your heart. And I like this verse. It settled it for me. The Lord says, whatever you ask in my name, I will do so that the Son may bring glory to the Father. So Clyde prayed, Lord, all of the Philippines, a church within walking distance of every Filipino, was that a godly dream? Absolutely. Because Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel. So it was a godly dream. It seemed amazing. And when he sent the plan over to the mission headquarters in Palo Alto, California, everybody said, Clyde is crazy as usual. You know, I mean, how are you going to do that? But it turned out to be true. Because it was a dream in the presence of God. It was a biblical dream. And they worked together as a team. And they learned by playing basketball that you work best when you work as a team. The Lord Jesus collected a team of 12 before he started on his mission. The Apostle Paul traveled with seven people at the peak. It's good to work as a team. And Clyde did it and you and I can do it too. And the Lord says, if it brings glory to the Father, I will answer your prayer. So pour out your heart and pray great prayers. That's what Clyde did. That's what many people have done who've seen the blessing of God. And then thirdly, you notice that the Lord is saying here, okay, dream great dreams. I'm going to the Father. That means I'm sending you the Holy Spirit. You'll have all the power you'll ever need. Dream great dreams. Second, pray great prayers. On the basis of those biblical dreams, pray great prayers. And then thirdly, he says, but don't just sit there dreaming. And praying, he says, if you love me, you will obey my commands. And you know, one good thing about Clyde, since we're remembering him with all the love of a guy that we truly, truly loved and uh, really walk with God, blessed you all of you here because of his presence and his leadership and his godliness and his super wife and his spiritual life. You know, he was an obedient man. He did what had to be done. He was relentless. He had goals and he went for them in prayer and in action. And so when the Lord says, dream great dreams, yes. Pray great prayers, of course. You're not going to do it on your own. But thirdly, he says, obey. If you love me, you will obey what I command. And you know the three big commands to never forget, the big ones, there's many others. First, love one another as I have loved you. You know, one great thing that I'm sure you learn, even unconsciously at Biola University, is that the body of Christ is transdenominational. This is a hundred years, a hundred years of this great college, university, and a great school that teaches the Word of God. From the get-go, uh, when Dr. Torrey started it out here on the West Coast with a group of businessmen, it was a dream to evangelize the world to keep the church as one and to get rid of anything that denigrated the Word of God, to make the Word of God the center of everything so that it would be a biblical church, one church across all denominations. And it's been that way all along. It's so exciting and it's such a great example to all the universities and colleges up and down the West Coast and, and even way beyond that. And so the third thing he says, obey my great commands. One is love one another as I have loved you. And you know the example from Dr. Cook. He was a lovable old bear, you know, and he loved people. And when he embraced you, he squeezed you and almost took the life off you. But he was a lovable guy. He really loved the whole body of Christ. Number two, the second great command is be holy because I am holy, says the Lord. Be holy because I am holy. If all those great dreams and all those great prayers are going to happen, you're not only going to have to love the whole body of Christ, but also live a holy life. Holy doesn't mean perfect. Holy simply means that you walk in the light through the Word of God by the power of the Holy Spirit. When you stumble, you confess it, get rid of it, and keep going. But walk in holiness. And then thirdly, go into all the world and preach the gospel. I'll tell you, obedience to the Word of God in evangelism will keep you happy, will keep you motivated, will keep you from getting uh, old or weird or negative or bitter 
Old Cook, you know, he's 72, right? More or less. 72, 73. I'm a year older than him, so I can speak with authority. And uh, uh, he was a man who walked in holiness. He was a happy, holy man. And he walked with the fullness of the Holy Spirit. And God, the Holy Spirit, used him to bless tens of thousands of millions of people. What a way to serve Jesus Christ. So as you remember, Dr. Cook, as you think about your own life, whether you're a freshman or a senior, think that at the end of your life, people will be able to say about you, he walked with God, he loved the whole body of Christ, he was a holy person or she was a holy person and always obeyed the Great Commission. I tell you, that's the way to end life victoriously, joyfully, triumphantly, and I'm sure Friday night <laughs> when old cook uh, knocked on the doors, uh, half of heaven was jumping up and down. And think how many Filipinos are there who were converted because of his work. Think how many Americans are there. Think through the ministry of the university, how many people from around the globe were probably welcoming him up there because he was faithful even unto death. So let's bow our heads in prayer, shall we, before Dr. Corey comes. Oh God, our Father, here we are in your holy presence thinking about our fabulous brother, Clyde Cook. Thank you, Lord, that from so young he committed his life to you, to serve you, to evangelize the world, to be faithful, to be holy, to love the whole body of Christ without discrimination. Oh God, we thank you for his example and we pray that each one of us, when we are called home one of these days, that it could be said by you, well done you good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over little, I'll put you over much. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Oh God, bless the student body, bless every woman that's here, every young man. Use them for your glory till the day you call them home. We ask it in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Luis. Your being here was providential, no doubt. Long before we knew what would transpire this past weekend, God did, and he brought you here. So the Lord bless you. Thank you. For the vast majority of you here in this chapel today, you spent most of your days at Biola University with Clyde Cook as your president. And he exhorted you in chapel, he encouraged you in the classroom, he talked with you on the sidewalk, he ate with you in the cafeteria. It's no doubt as I look around today, I see some of you wearing your I Love Clyde shirts, that you mean it, you do, and we do. Clyde Cook loved you, and he prayed for you, and he prayed with you. He made you think, and he made you laugh. He was approachable, he was funny, he was there. He pointed your horizons through the bigness of God and the authority of God's word and a passion for the Great Commission beyond all of that petty stuff and challenged you to think big on that world outside of Biola University, that world that is broken and God so desperately wants to see redeemed. He believed in you and he loved you. For 25 years, Clyde Cook gave himself as president of Biola and for many years, even more than that. He embodied Biola, its heritage, its values, its biblical fidelity, its commission to go out and evangelize the world. When people across the country and around the world saw Clyde Cook, they saw Biola. We even look up to that plaque illuminated on the wall right there, the place where Clyde Cook would gather in this room to worship that plaque that was dedicated in his honor last fall and now remains there in his memory, remembering that this is a place where Clyde Cook loved to be with you, the students, the faculty, the staff that he loved. After returning from speaking at a Bible Institute in Houston on Friday, Dr. Cook was at home with his wife Annabelle when he passed away and he entered into the presence of the Lord. The final address that he would give was on Thursday night, the evening prior. He wasn't feeling well. Annabelle told me that, 
but he stepped up to the mic. And from the strength that only the Lord could give him, he gave an address that ended with words something like this. The final part, the final address that Clyde Cook gave. The final quality I believe every student must have, he said, is to make an impact to endure constantly. We want our students to hang in there. We don't want them to quit. We want them to persevere, to keep moving. Or as the apostle Paul has written, he said, let us not be weary in well-doing for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. If we are normal, we will have moments when we will want to quit, Clyde Cook said on Thursday night as he wrapped up that address. My word to all of us is don't quit. The Lord will help you through the crisis, through the pressure for his kingdom and for his glory. Clyde Cook lived those words he proclaimed on Thursday night. And on Friday night, he heard those words, well done, good and faithful servant. For Clyde Cook green big, he lived by the authority of God's word. He saw the world as a place God wanted to redeem in winsome ways, in loving ways, but in bold, audacious ways, as Luis just shared with us. So it is with profound sadness that we mourn the loss of our beloved friend and leader, President Emeritus Clyde Cook. This news of his passing away has stunned us all. We grieve deeply with Annabelle, with Laura who's here today, with Craig, with their families. I promised Annabelle on Friday night that their Biola University family would prayerfully stand with them through these days of extraordinary loss. Dr. Cook was long loved by this community and he has in countless ways, through countless lives, impact this world for the Lord Jesus Christ. We will miss him dearly. I will miss him, and he was a new friend to me. I can't imagine how much more those of you who worked alongside him, senior levels of leadership, faculty and students, many of you for decades and decades stood alongside, serving shoulder to shoulder with this man, the inimitable Clyde Cook. This week we're gonna be having some special occasions to celebrate his life and to remember his legacy. And here's what you should keep in mind, and you can also find this online. We're gonna keep updating the website with some of the uh, events that will take place this week. It actually began uh, even last night as student-led, and this place is so profoundly spiritually led by the hearts of our students in many ways, gathered underneath those bells and began to worship the Lord, the one to whom Clyde Cook recently cast before him his crown. We worshiped together, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and what a moment that was. And this evening, we'll have a chance to gather together on the Metzger lawn for a candlelight memorial service, just a simple time of prayer. I encourage you to be there. Make sure that you come and, and invite others as we pray and worship and remember this giant among us who we lost on Friday night. April 16th to 18th this week, how fitting it is that our annual missions conference will take place. And Clyde Cook, who had a heart for missions, loved this moment. So let's do it upright this week in his memory. And we're gonna be holding the 2008 missions conference here at Biola University in the memory of Clyde Cook this year. After a private graveside service on Friday, Saturday morning at 11 o'clock at Fullerton EV Free, there'll be a memorial service. During that time, folks will gather around and pay tribute to this man. On Monday, here in this chapel, 9.30, we're gonna have our own memorial service. Remembering Clyde Cook, details of this program will be coming to you soon. After the chapel service here, there'll be a reception in the courtyard outside of the library. There, the heritage room, which in many ways honor the, honors the 25 years that Clyde and Annabelle Cook served this school so faithfully. There'll be a chance to remember Clyde Cook through some of the exhibits in that, in that heritage room that was recently dedicated just a few months ago. It's a glorious day in heaven. It's a sad day here. As we remember the man, the legend, the legacy, the I love Clyde man 
that has impacted our lives in so many ways. Stand with me as we pray, and then we're going to close in singing together the doxology, song that will be sung in the heavens. And so, Lord, we pause this morning and remember your servant, our friend, our leader, our brother in Christ, Clyde Cook. So many of us have stories that speak to the courage of his convictions, the ideals that he championed, the way in which he loved us, and the way in which he came alongside us and cared for us with kind words and gentle notes and a loving Christ-like way. We pray this morning for Annabelle. Surround her with your presence, we pray. Lift her up, give her peace, Give her that sense of hope. The same we pray for Laura, for Craig, for the six grandchildren, for the family. Lord, surround them with your presence and attend to their needs. And may we as a community who loves this family so much and cherishes the legacy of this man, may we come alongside in practical ways and in prayerful ways to stand with them during this hour of need. We pray all this in the powerful, matchless name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.